Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad to be back in the house of the Lord? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Didn't we have a good time last night? Amen. Praise the Lord. I love it whenever the Lord is in the house and He's doing great and mighty things. I'm just glad that He allowed me to be there when it happened. Anywhere else we could have been, we would not have received the blessing that we received last night. No. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, let's worship the Lord tonight. I'm just going to step out of the way here, and let's just worship. You know, these folks, they ain't up here just to entertain. They're up here to just worship, and we worship and love them. Amen. So let's worship them tonight.
there ought to be a desire in our heart to worship. Hallelujah. I love to worship God. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we talk about, you know, everybody praise the Lord and everybody say, praise the Lord. But really, when you praise somebody, you know, if I started praising Brother Darren, I said, man, Brother Darren, man, he, he's got so many different skills, man. He can work on heavy equipment. He can work on electrical. He can work on plumbing. You know, that's praising somebody. And when we praise God, we brag on what God can do. And the more we brag on what God can do, the more faith we have in Him to do what we need Him to do. Praise God. I thank God for all His many blessings. Praise God. Hallelujah. We'll try to sing a song here. Hallelujah. Well, the journey of mine is going blank right here. You say yours does sometimes. It happens when you're alone. Yeah. I, I had a mind once, honest.
tried my best, brother, not to hold any grudges against anybody. Yeah. You know, someone asked me to forgive them for something. I said, well, it's already been done. Yeah. Because I got to stay in practice if I'm going to make it. You can't hold grudges against anybody. But I know Brother Thomas, he, he kind of preached on that subject here a while back about, you know, not holding hard feelings and grudges against anybody. I got to think it. No, I can't think of anybody. You know, I've held any grudges against. I'm thinking church folk, you know, Brother Darren. And uh, something kind of hit me. There's, there's stories I've told about 12 years old when these two boys just kind of caught me on the side street one time, beat me up. Just for the fun of beating me up. You know, it's hard to have a good feeling towards someone like that, you know? After Brother Thompson preached that, I got thinking, man, have I forgiven them folks? So I had to now start praying for them, Brother Reverend, and asking God to save their souls. Lord, you know, I might not be there to talk to them. I don't know where them guys are, but Lord, you can let somebody meet them that knows this truth and can lead them to the truth. You know, I've had situations that happen, man. Most of you know what I used to be a drug dealer before I come and come to church before God got a hold of me and changed my life. But I've been in some situations where I have caused to hold grudges against people. But you know what? I feel like I've forgiven every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But Brother Reverend, you got me thinking again, Lord, is there something? After you talked about Brother Billy Cole, Lord, is there something maybe I forgot about that I haven't got right? Lord, help me, Lord. It is important, church. It is important that we don't have any grudges against anybody. No hard feelings. Whether it's family or somebody you don't know, just, you know, you can't hold hard feelings against people. I've got to stay in practice. If I'm going to make it, brother, praise God.
Thank you for your ministry, your testimony here in the house of God. You're a true warrior of the kingdom. Bless God. Genesis 32 and verse number 24. When you're there, say, I'm there. And Jacob was left alone. Everybody say, alone. And there wrestled with him a man. There wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, there's several he's, so i got to make this more clear. And when he, the man, saw that he, the man, prevailed not against him, Jacob, he, the man, touched the hollow of his, Jacob's thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. The man asked Jacob to let me go. The man says to Jacob, let me go, the day is breaking. And Jacob said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And so the man said unto Jacob, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob said unto him, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? Why do you want to know who I am? It's almost like you're saying my name is important. You'll find out why it's important later. And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, or Peniel in Hebrew, the sun rose up upon him, and he halted, or limped, upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he, this man, touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. All right, I read nine verses to you there. I'm done in the opening text. This is only the beginning of this sermon. Very deep thought for you tonight. Preach to you on what happens after you wrestle. What happens after, say after. What happens after you wrestle. Lord, speak to us. Let us have ears to hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And God, once more, let it not be Joel who speaks, but let it be Jesus who preaches this word through me. Jesus, speak to me. Speak to all of us. Speak through me. Speak through every soul here. Let us open our minds, our ears, and our hearts to receive your word with gladness and with joy. Let us all draw waters out of your well of salvation. May we all say in Jesus' name. Amen. Clap your hands to God as you are seated at Iron Hill Pentecostal Church. The Bible says that there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. But this man was no ordinary man, was it? Sometimes interesting scenarios begin when we think we're wrestling with a man. We think we're wrestling with a human being, with a boss at work, with a member of our family, with a human concern, or a very human fleshly issue. But in point of fact, we are not at all wrestling with any ordinary man in our life, because this man was no ordinary man. And don't misquote me, and don't believe wrong. This man was not an angel. Prove to me where it ever says the word angel in this text. It doesn't. In fact, it, it says that someone higher than the angels was here wrestling with Jacob. And Jacob knew it. And Jacob got it. Jacob called the name of the place Penuel, or Peniel in Hebrew. And Penuel means facing God. Jacob even said it. I have seen God face to face. And my life is preserved. That man wasn't a man, no ordinary man in point of fact. He looked like a man and appeared as a man. He was in the similitude of a man, but he was not an ordinary human being. That was God! He changed Jacob's name. No man has the power to change your identity, 
Not even the U.S. government. Not even a plastic surgeon in some slice and dice hospital somewhere in this great nation can change your identity. Only one person can change your name. It is not even an angel. It's God. Only God has the power to tell you who you are. Before I formed me in the belly, I, I knew you and I called you as a prophet to the nation. That's what God told Jeremiah the prophet in the book of Jeremiah. Him. God knew him and God called him. God gave him his identity in the womb. It's almost like life began before birth. It's almost like he was who he was in the womb. Yeah. That is why we are pro life here in the Apostolic Church. Yeah. Wasn't what I planned on preaching on, but it's biblical right there. God formed you in the womb, God identified you. Before I tell you what happens after you wrestle with God, I first have to walk you through how exactly to get to the wrestling match. After Seymour, I'm convinced that 80 or 90 percent of apostolics take 30 years to get here. It took Jacob about 30 years to even reach the point where he was ready to even encounter God for this wrestling match. 20 or 30 years he wasted in Haran, right? 20 or 30 years he lived in Haran, say Haran. Those wasted years in Haran under Laban. Don't you feel like that? You've wasted some time under some Labans of your life, false bosses, drill sergeants of the world, people who tried to wreck you and ruin you and use you and wad you up and spit you out like some old washcloth or paper towel. That is the Laban of your life. If someone uses you, they are a Laban. God comes to you in your deepest, darkest seasons and feeds you. Laban comes to you in your deepest, darkest seasons and uses you for things. That is the difference between God and a Laban. So what do you do? You've got to get away from Laban. He got away from Laban, but not just Laban. You know how many folks he got away from? Everyone. Open your Bibles up again. Genesis chapter 32. Verse 24. And we're all going to say the first opening sentence of verse 24 together. Genesis 32 and verse 24. Go there, please. The Bible says, And Jacob was left alone. alone. That's the secret to hearing from God. You've got to get away from the spiritual static. All that radio static that is on your prayer time. Drowning out the voice of the Lord God and the voice of the anointing and the voice of ministry and the voice of the Bible and the voice of God himself trying to call you out to consecration and call you out to new heights in your life and a new levels of experience of the supernatural. But if I'm having too much noise, too much ninny noise around me in my life, then I I've got too much. I tried finding the radio station a while back for 91.1 in Memphis, Tennessee. It's a national public radio. They have news and they have just classical music, which is, I suppose, not sinful. Just little music and violins and cellos playing in the background. It was something I could listen to in my travels, but then I couldn't find the station. I had the awfulest time finding that station. I kept dialing the knob, but I couldn't find 91.1, and about 60 seconds in, I realized that, that I was on AM and not FM. Ever done that? Ever been looking for the gospel station? You can't find it because you're on the wrong type of radio? AM instead of FM, some of you have been trying the wrong kind of radio. You've been trying the radios of televangelists. Is that okay here on Saturday evening? And the radios of podcast prophets and armchair apostles. And don't misquote me. I believe in prophets. I believe in apostles. I believe in evangelists and pastors and teachers and all the gifts of ministry. But not every person who says they're anointed is anointed. 
created. Not every person who calls himself a teacher is sent from God. There are false teachers. There are false apostles. There are false prophets, false pastors, and false evangelists. That is why we need discernment in the apostolic church. That's why we need the supernatural in the kingdom of God. We must be able to tell what is of God and what's not. I got excited there. Because this issue excites me. We must have discernment. We must be able to tell if we're dialing into the right station. To find the voice of God, Jacob had to get alone. You know who else did that? Jesus. Read the stories in the Gospels. He preached to thousands. Then go off to some mountain apart to pray. You know why? Because he was giving us the example. We can't seek crowd appeal or we'll lose the voice of God. If we seek to follow the crowd, we will miss the still small voice. Elijah goes to the cave. I know God never told Elijah to go to that cave. But all the same, when he got to the cave, he heard from God. And sometimes if it takes a cave, then a cave is the best call. I get it. Moses went to the backside of the desert in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1, didn't he? And sometimes you feel like you're there in that backside of the desert. Everybody say the middle of nowhere. But if you have to go to the middle of nowhere, maybe that is the exact spiritual geographical location of your burning bush moment. The burning bush, the voice of God, and the recommissioning of Moses. His call to ministry as an octogenarian. He received the call at the age of 80. It happened when he got himself away from the crowd. Just him and the sheep and the cactus and the sand dunes. Then he heard. Take 
the time you have to take to shut off every other voice and cut off every other weight and get away from the crowd and spend time with God. I've seen backsliders wrestle with God, Pastor. I've seen backsliders get down there in that very altar in revivals here at Iron Hill Pentecostal Church and take the time that they have to take before God touches their heart and touches their mind. And by the way, in the name of Jesus, don't interfere with that backsliders wrestling match. If they're praying in the altar call, don't stop them and stand them up so that so you could be some big kahuna and some big cheese and say that you prayed them through. Let them pray for a while. If they're attempting to hear from God, don't try and cease and stop and interfere with their prayer life because you realize what you did in that moment. You quench the spirit. And the Bible says quench not the spirit of God. If you interfere, if I interfere with somebody, oh, they're trying to get back right. I'm not helping them. I'm hurting them. If they have to pray for 30 minutes, let them pray until God begins to move in their mind. Clap your hands to God. <laughs> Had to preach all this. Now to get you here, what happens after the wrestling match? There were three things that Jacob did not or could not do after this wrestling match. Three things were now almost impossible once Jacob received his new identity. The first thing Jacob did not do after this, he did not wrestle. Okay? Broke a leg at all, Jacob did not wrestle anymore. What does that signify, dear preacher? I'm glad you asked me. That signifies conflict. The wrestling. Jacob not wrestling anymore. He had no more conflicts. Think about this. We have an addiction in the apostolic church. Our addiction is not cigarettes, pornography, alcohol, topless clubs, lying, cheating, our addiction is conflict. Conflict addiction. I have seen people consecrate in every holiness standard, but then engage in conflict with their brothers. See, last night is tied and connected into this service. Last night I preached about gossip. And tonight, the very first thing Jacob could not do is enter into any more conflicts. It's addictive to think, I'm better than them. And one of the ways that spirit of I am better than you manifests is when I gossip about you. But if I can't gossip about you, my second option is I want to have conflict with you. I, I want to have justified arguments against you. Uh, why I don't like you. Uh, why I even have the right to hate you. Uh, but I would never say that out loud. Uh, and so I, instead I say, uh, I just hate what they're doing. Uh, and I hate who they are. Uh, and I hate what they stand for. Uh, but in reality, you hate them. Uh, you hate them. Uh, just let certain people have hated other people throughout all of human history. And hatred cancels the anointing of God. You can't hate your brother and say that you're saved. I read 1 John 3 and 15 last night. I'm going to say it and quote it again. Whosoever hateth this brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. If I hate my brother, I shall not walk on streets of gold. You may feel like you're justified in your conflict. Once you decide that you are the decider of who's right and wrong, guess who you've made yourself? Judge. Right. God is the only one who is called the judge. Right. If you have taken up the seat of judgment, you have put yourself in the place of God. You have made yourself an egotist. Egotism is idol worship. Selfishness and egotism is the idolatry of me. It's making me, myself, into my own personal idol. What I want and who I think I should be and what I desire to have in my 
life. But once God kills that spirit of I'm right, once that, once that spirit, that, that attitude, let me repeat that, once God kills the spirit of I'm right, because hear me, hear me, Iron Hill Church, you won't make peace with people as long as you think you're right. As long as you're saying, I'm right, and they're wrong with God, you won't make peace. When you forgive them, though, then the season of healing and peace can start. When you're willing to say, I'll put down the wrestlings, I'll put down the conflicts, I'll put down the arguments, I'll put down all of my justifications, all of my long sentences of paragraphs and words of why I think they're doing bad and I'm doing good. I give it all up. The wrestling spirit has got to die if Jacob is going to become Israel. I'm going to have power with God like Jacob got power with God. I'm going to be filled with the Holy Ghost and led by the Holy Ghost. Then I end my attitude of wrestling. I end my ability to have conflict with my brothers anymore. If you receive that, so I receive that. Now take 30 seconds and ask God, is there anybody you've had conflict with that God wants you to stop having conflict with? Everyone right now, go into prayer for 30 seconds and ask God, Lord, is there any conflict that you want me to exit from? Is there anybody I've been wrestling with that you want me to stop wrestling with? Is there anyone that I have felt justified in my arguments against? And now you're saying, just pull back from that. Any fights? That it's time for me to end. You know, God was done with this fight. God told him, let me go. God was done with that fight. Some fights God was done with 30 years ago. But we kept on fighting all through the night because we like the fight. Sometimes we like the fight more than we want peace and the peace speaker in our lives. Is there any fight that you know in your heart God told you to stop fighting 20 years ago? Is there any conflict and wrestling match that God was done with eight hours ago? Well, I kept on fighting it. Take five more seconds, 10 more seconds, 20 more seconds right now in prayer. Just one more time say, God, is there any fight that you want me to stop fighting in Jesus' name? The first thing Jacob could not do so he couldn't wrestle anymore. Second thing Jacob could not do after the wrestling match is he could not lie. Jacob had lied all of his life. From the moment that he lied in Genesis chapter 27 and verse number 19 and said, I am Esau, your firstborn, Isaac, he devoted himself to a life of falsehood. The first person that Jacob ever lied to was Jacob. He thought he needed to become Esau. Do you know what covetousness is? Covetousness is lying to yourself. Covetousness is the lie, the self-told lie that I would be better if I were more like them. I would have it all if I had what they had. I would be good if I was like that brother or that sister over there. Covetousness is actually mental lying to yourself. So the first person we lie to is between two years. Our own mind. And what God breaks, he breaks the spirit of unspoken lies when he breaks the spirit of covetousness. From this point on, Jacob never lies again. He never lies to himself. He stops trying to be Esau, and he's not even going to try and be who he once was years ago. Now God changes all that. God flips the script and says, we're starting over. You're not even Jacob, and you're certainly not, not Esau either. Now you are Israel. You have a new identity. God breaks the spirit of lying. Jacob never lies even one time. I challenge you to read the next 18 chapters of Genesis. Chapter 33 through 50. There's not even one lie there that Jacob ever tells again. No wrestling, no conflicts. Everybody say, no conflicts. No conflicts. Now say, no lies. No lies. I challenge you. I'm going to repeat this and reiterate this. Don't lie to yourself. Don't believe a lie. 
The Bible says those who believe a lie, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, those who believe a lie would be damned, condemned to hell. They receive strong delusion because they receive not the love of the truth. Hear me. Hear the voice of Christ. If you don't receive the love of the truth, you will believe a lie. If you don't love the will of God, you've got to find a way to love the will of God. You must find a way to fall in love with God's plan and God's path and God's purpose and God's manna and God's word and God's people and God's worship. Amen. Fall in love with the ways of the Lord and you will not be deluded. You will not lie even to yourself. God is called the way, the truth, and the life. That truth name, the second name, God is called the truth. If your father is the truth, there ought be no lie in you, the sons and daughters of the truth. If I'm a son and, a, and if you're a daughter of the truth, then no untruth should dwell anywhere in my heart. If you receive that, clap your hands to God right now. The third is the hardest. The third, I'll just admit this, the third is the one that I wrestle with the most. Confession is good for the soul. He could not wrestle, he could not lie. But the third thing Jacob could not do after that wrestling match, he could not run. You know why? Broke thigh bone. Can't run on a broke thigh, on a broke hip, can you? Anybody ever had a broken leg here in the house of God? I actually broke my leg when I was four years old. I was, I was, not, no, I was two years old. Pastor Larry Blackwell was pastoring the Decaturville Church. And two-year-old Joel went with my dad as dad was preaching revival out there. And two-year-old toddler Joel managed to get himself up on top of the drum stool at Decaturville. I jumped off and hurt my leg. It healed up pretty good. But had to watch how I walked for a while. When you break that leg, have to watch how you walk for a while. Jacob could not run anymore. God broke his ability to even walk normally. Now he would walk even slower than everybody else. Why would God remove his ability to run? I don't know if you all are sports fanatics, but... The running game is strong in certain sports teams in certain years. The running game was always strong in Jacob's life. In Jacob's life, he would run all the time. Jacob, when he got in trouble with his father, Isaac, and his brother, Esau, do you know what Jacob did? He ran. Ran to the land of Haran. And when Jacob made a big old stink with his father-in-law, Laban, you know what Jacob did? He ran from Laban. He left in like the middle of the night, if I comprehend it correctly, and Laban like took off after him with a whole army of people to catch him and bring him back. He went on the run. The running game was Jacob's default option. And when things did not work out, Jacob said, I'm going to run away. And now God says, no, you ain't. You're not going to run anymore. <laughs> well, God, don't you know the devil's chasing me? Yep, he does. And you're not going to run away from them anymore. <clears throat> now you're going to have to face down the scariest things of your life. Congratulations, David. You're going to face down Goliath. The thing that scared every other warrior, you're going to face him. Uh -huh. Why would God take away your ability to run? He makes you face something that you would never have faced otherwise. As you stand, let me tell you what's possible once you can't run anymore. Genesis chapter 33, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Genesis 33, verse 1. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came. Everybody say Esau. Esau. Esau came, and with him 400 men. This was not a social visit. You don't bring 400 people to go to KFC. He was coming to kill him. Do you see it? He brought 400 people 
because he was going to take out Jacob. He'll take him out, kill him. What does Jacob do? Jacob divided the children to Leah and Rachel and the two handmaids. In verse 2, he put the handmaids and their children foremost, Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. Verse 3, and he, Jacob, passed over before them. Catch this. Jacob puts all his family behind him, and he walks in front of them. He puts them behind him, and he goes first. Because now he has flipped his identity from selfishness to selflessness. Now he puts them behind him because he thinks to himself, if Esau is angry at me, he'll kill me first. And then his bloodlust and appetite for revenge would be sated. When you spend enough time with God, selflessness dies, or selfishness dies, and selflessness lives. The egotist inside of you ends, and the humble man, the Moses, sprouts and takes root. Once you have to face down the Esau, the thing that you would never have faced, once you can't run away anymore, and you have to face the Esau issue down in your life, I want you to see what God can do. I want everyone in this room to turn to Genesis 33 and look along with me as I read these verses. And he passed over before them, and he bowed himself to the ground seven times. And Jacob bowed seven times to the ground. Here's a great sermon title, The Seven Humiliations of Jacob. Until he came near to his brother. And now verse 4. Genesis 33 and verse 4. What happens when you can't run away from Esau anymore? Look at what God can do. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. When you stop running, then God can work a miracle. This following miracle. He can make peace with you in the issue that you thought there would always be conflict in. Now God, the peace speaker, can still the stormy waters of that issue staring you down. God can even make you to have peace with Esau. God is the original peace speaker. When the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters in Genesis, God spoke light and life. And God can speak light and life upon all the dark waters of your soul. Whatever Esau is for you, a bad shake at your job, problems with the boss, problems in the house, problems with your family, problems even with ministry and church. If you're willing to quit running, if you're willing to stop running, and stand. God can speak peace in those old, irreconcilable, unfixable circumstances. God, his name is the peace speaker, the Prince of Peace. Let that Prince of Peace speak over you tonight. At this time, these altars are open, and I invite you to come. Would all of you leave the pews and come to the altar right now. Find a place to pray. I preached different tonight. This message was harder for me than last night because I feel a wrestling match inside of somebody here. You want the conflict, and God wants the peace. Will you do what God wants you to do, or will you do what you want to do? Do you love the wrestling match so much that you're willing for your marriage to die or your ministry to end? Or your family to never speak to you again? Why? Or will you make this difficult resolution? I'm done running. Amen. From this day onward, I'm going to take my stand. God's going to speak peace to me. Three things you can't do in this new season. First, no more conflicts. You will not start any more conflicts and not choose to have any conflicts at all from this day forward. Second, no more lying. 
Pilate said, I find no fault with this man. But am I willing to say what even Pilate won't say? Will I try and find conflicts that even men like Pilate wouldn't find? Even Pilate had no conflict with Jesus. Am I worse than Pilate? Will I have conflicts all over seasons of my life where even the world would not? No conflicts, first of all. Secondly, no lying. I won't even lie to myself. I won't lie to God. I won't lie to my spouse. I won't even keep secrets from my wife or my husband. Got it? Hello, somebody. No lying. And thirdly, and finally, no running. Everybody say, no running. No lying. No and no conflicts. Find a place of prayer right now all across Iron Hill Pentecostal Church. Find a place to kneel down, sit down, or stand and make those three resolutions. No running, no lying, no conflicts. If I'm going to be Israel, those are the requirements. That is the cost of my new identity in the Lord. In Jesus' name. Touch the feet of your master. Touch the throne of God. And receive that there is a balm in Gilead. There is a new life that God has for you. There is a new way and a new path. I can live peaceably with all men. Receive God's identity as the peace seeker. If you are the sons and daughters of the peace seeker, then you should speak peace as well.
this spiritual secret here. It wasn't actually Esau or Isaac or Laban or Rebecca's mother or Rachel and Leah's wives or the handmaids or his children. Let me tell you the person that Jacob didn't have peace with. Jacob. Jacob didn't have peace with Jacob. He didn't have peace with himself. I think he had turmoil inside of himself. So he kept trying to be Esau or kept trying to wheel and deal and scheme and dream and do all kinds of things. Because Jacob couldn't forgive Jacob. And Jacob couldn't have peace with Jacob. So the first person you're going to make peace with after God is yourself. You're going to make peace with yourself. I want to give you some more secrets about prayer. This is revelatory. This changed my life. When you're upset, God knows that you're upset. I know it's mind-blowing, right? When you're mad, God knows that you're mad. Shocking, right? Don't hide that from the Lord. When you're praying, the best thing you could do is be honest with Jesus. Because He already knows. If you're mad, say, God, I'm mad. If you're upset, start the initial times of prayer by saying, God, I'm really upset. I need your help. Because God already knows. And let me tell you something. If you try and pray through it, you're just going to be praying mad for 30 minutes and you won't be effective. Effectual prayers are honest prayers. If you try and lie to God, lies are sin. The first person you're going to be honest with is God, and the second person you're going to be honest with is yourself. I'm preaching to somebody here right now. And you won't have peace with God, and you won't have peace with your brothers until you learn to make peace with yourself. Find a place to say, you know what? I'm going to be real. I'm going to speak from a place of honesty. I'm going to say, God, I'm having these issues, and I need your intervention. Can we all do that? Can we begin to pray honest prayers? I want to have a five-minute prayer session here in this altar call for the next five minutes. I want you all to find a place of prayer, sitting, kneeling, or standing, whatever is most comfortable for you. But take the next five minutes and just pray honest prayers. God, I'm hurt. God, I'm upset. God, I've had a conflict with this person or that person. I need you to help me with this. I want you to have five minutes of prayer, honesty. When you have honesty, then you can begin to have peace. Say, Lord, I've struggled with this addiction here. I'm trying to make peace with myself and with you, Lord Jesus. Help me in this circumstance, in this battle, in this war. I've been fighting this fight, and I have not wanted to admit it to you, God. But you already know anyway, so I might as well tell you, God, I struggle with this and that. I need your grace. I need you to change me. I need you to make Jacob into Israel, God. Because you have the power to do that. Help me become different. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief was the prayer of one young man in the Gospels. Pray whatever you have to pray, but make it an honest prayer. Be honest. Be real with the Lord God right now. Have no facade and no plastic wrap and no pretend. No music right now. I'm going to clear the platform off again. I'm going to have the whole leadership team and music team all pray as well because God is doing a full church repair job right here. Everybody on the platform, I want you in the altar right now. God is trying to repair some old issues and some things that have taken up time in your life for 20 years and 30 years. You're going to have an honest prayer time with God where you say, Lord, I battle these things. No more pretend, no more hiding, no more holding it back. God, I struggled with this. And I need you to do something about it. In the name of Jesus. Wrestle if you have to. Wrestle.
wrestle with God as long as it takes. And once you're done wrestling, you're done wrestling. And the conflict season is over. But the conflict season won't end until you take all this to God Himself. Until you are facing God at your penuel. You won't get what you need. you got to be real with the Lord. Jacob asked God to bless him. He'd been asking God for blessings for 30 years. Isaac blessed me. God blessed me. Esau blessed me. It's time to take all this to God. Say, Lord, say whatever you want to say, whatever you would like to say to me. Hear the voice of Christ tonight. Hear the voice of Christ. Jesus is reaching out to you. Be honest with Him. Turn into that heaven's radio station. Hear the still small voice.
Brown's heart. Careful, we get too big of a hurry. We think we've been here before. We think I pray. I talk to God all the time. Sometimes we just need to disengage and unplug and give God time to speak. We always like to be heard, oh, yeah. but so does he. He spoke to us two services now about letting things go. instruction tonight to quit running. Quit lying. You know the bad thing about lying is you lie to yourself before you ever lie to anybody else. Yeah. You may speak that lie out, but you lied to yourself when you made it up. Ever know anybody that was so good at lying that they started believing it is true? I know people like that. You ever done it? You know who it hurts the most? Us. That's why the, the Lord said in Revelation that all liars, all liars, all liars, would inherit that like a fire. They will inhabit it. But you know what comes right before that? Fearful. You know what happens when you get scared? You start lying. Try to get out of trouble. Try not to hurt somebody's feelings. 
Try to cover up something you gossip about. Ooh. talking to somebody the other day and I tell them I said you know the Lord said let your yea be yea and your nay be nay if we could do that we'd be a lot better off yeah. you'd be kind of a boring person to talk to yeah. but you'd be a lot better off in other words he's saying keep your conversation short and direct and to the point Evil communication, communication does what? Corrupts good man. Corrupts good man. We always talk about praying. But the Lord's trying to tell us the last two nights. I don't know if you've caught this or not, but He's trying to tell you, yeah. I want you to pray and talk to me, but I want you to stop and listen. He wrestled with the man all night. Hello. You ever wrestled with something all night long? Did you get victory over it in the morning? Or did you just get up and go about your day and wrestle with it the next night too? It's time for the church of the living God. Quit running. Quit hiding. We're lying. Stand your ground and let God be God. Amen. Let Him fight your battles. Let Him give the answer. He said if we open our mouth, he'd fit it. It didn't just mean when you were preaching. Well, I don't know what to say exactly. That's the best thing to do. Let him talk. Let him say. Amen. It'll keep us out of a whole lot of trouble. It'll keep us pleasing to God. We won't have to lie about anything. So many years he's been wanting for us to hear him, to hear his voice. But a lot of times we, we won't stop long enough. Well, I've got to have a healing. I've got to have a vision. I've got to have bills paid. I've got to have. Seek ye first the kingdom of God place where he rules. I dare say you would not walk in the kingdom and start spouting off what you need and what you want. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't do that in a king's court. Any other king. Yeah. But yet we do it in the kingdom of God. I need, I want, I desire God's saying, who's on the throne here? Near you. Hallelujah. Yes. Jacob found himself alone. That's when everything started to change. The 
Lord told us to get in our prayer closet. That means in a place alone. That's right. Desire time with just Him. That's right. Turn off the computer. Turn off Facebook. Get a little face time with Him. When you can't when you can't stop your life long enough to let him be the major part of it, how do you expect how do we expect to ever have a move of God in our life? And how do we expect for him to be in control when we won't shut down? I know it's quiet in here. That's okay. There's too much racket. There's too many things that distract us and keep us away from our time with God. But I've got other things to do. But I've got issues. Welcome to life. But if we'll learn to get with him and just listen. I'll never forget what I heard Dr. Jeffers say. Me and Brother Ray was talking about this last night. I was telling him. Dr. Gerald Jeffers said, I, he said, I, I, I locked myself in. And I would lock myself away in, in the church. Or I would, he said, I would just, I would get away from everybody. Away from the telephone and away from the computers and away from the iPads. And, and he said, I would, I would just get myself alone wow. for days at a time. He said, I read the, the, the Proverbs until, you know, he said, until angels actually appeared. And would minister to me. He said, and during that time, God showed me something unique and revelatory. He said, I started to ask God, well, what about this and what about that? And God said, wait a minute. You'll get a lot more out of this if you'll just listen and let me talk. But he had to get himself alone before he could ever get to that point. When's the last time you fasted? Did you know you can pray without fasting? But you ain't gonna fast without praying. Right. You start cutting that food out, she feel to start talking to God. I need some help. Distraction could be keeping you from that oh so important word that the Lord has for you. I remember very distinctly a man of God was telling, he said that a woman had wanted to come to a meeting that he was at and said that she, the only way she could get there was another woman was going to have to bring her. She said that this woman was, was always just talking and talking and talking. She said she just hardly wouldn't have quit. She said so. Finally they got ready to go to the meeting. And on the way to the meeting they had a crash. Put both of them in the hospital. And this woman that was wanting to go so bad, she got to talking to her friend. They were in a room together there at the hospital, and she said, 
I just can't understand why something like this would happen, and that's on our way to go be in a service with God. And the other woman that liked to talk all the time and just never would be quiet, she said, oh, well, I had a dream three days ago that said if we went anywhere that we'd be on a bad car crash. She said, why didn't you tell me? She said, well, I just didn't think about it anymore. Hello? Why? She was too busy. She had too many other things to talk about. Too many other things to go on with. So she washed it out of her mind. How many times has the Lord given you something or tried to give you something and he couldn't get the voice in edgewise? He couldn't get himself heard because you had too many other things that you were plugged into. You know, one of the greatest, greatest things that you will lie about is why you weren't able to do the things of God. Well, I wasn't able to come to church because I don't have the money. But I was able to go do what I wanted to do on Monday morning. If you can make it to work, you can make it to church. You can do what you want to do. If you don't have a desire, yes. where the Lord says, I am persuaded. But you know, that's the problem. A lot of us ain't just really persuaded. You know why you don't pray? You ain't persuaded. You know why you don't fast? You ain't persuaded. You know why you don't come to church every time the doors are open? Because you just can't persuade it. We're going to be persuaded about the things of God. We've got to be with Him. We've got to spend time with Him. You're not going to give your heart and life to somebody you don't know. I've told you before, when God said it at the end, He said people stand before me and say, well, I've cast out devil in your name. I've done this and I've done that. And he said, I never knew you. He's saying you never come up in my bedroom. You never came up into a place that we could be intimate together. There's nothing that's ever showed that you love me or have anything to do with me because you always kept me in a distance. I was only there to supply what you needed. never knew you. You never loved me. But I love the Lord. Yeah. Do Don't prove it to me. Show him. Say amen, say all me. Hallelujah. Y'all know by now. I'm just gonna speak what I feel to speak. I ain't just speaking, y'all. My toes are blistered too. I stepped on mine just as much as I stepped on y'all. Ain't nobody in here couldn't be closer to 
to God. Amen. Every one of us. Stand with me tonight. If you can. <laughs> that bottle has got anointing all in it. If we call if we called up here and we took that and we put oil on your head, you would be anointed. This is the vessel. This is the vessel. We need to start acting like we're anointed. We are the child of the king. We're anointed. We need to spend time with him. The one who Gives the anointing. Let's talk to him right now. I thought I'm before you show. Lord, I desire a time with you. Not once a week, not once a month, surely not once a year. But Lord, I I require a time with you. I want a day to walk with you, Lord. Not just, not just here and there, but Lord, I want something that's, that's permanent, something that's, that's every day. That's, there's just not a season for it, Lord, but there is a, there's a need in my life, Lord God, that I have to divide myself from all the things of this world, and I have to pull myself into you. I have to bring myself as a little child, Lord, and just bring myself to you. Oh, Lord. And so that I can just love you, and I can, I, can, I can trust you, Lord, and I can lay myself in your sweet, glorious hands, Lord, and I don't have to worry about the things of this life. I don't have to worry about all the distractions. Lord, Lord. I can just sit there and listen to my father as he tells me about the thing that I need to know. Oh, Lord God, we think we know so much in this day and age. But you said in your word, I am wisdom. Oh, mighty God, you have, you have so much to give us, Lord, that we, that we need, but we're so busy trying to gather for ourselves that we have forsaken the most important part about our relationship. We've forsaken that time of healing, of refreshing, that time of restoration, Lord, that only comes in your presence and from your word and from your spirit. We get too caught up in the whirlwinds, and we get too caught up in the fires. We get caught up too much in the glamorous, the flash, Lord, all along, it's just that still, small voice that changes everything. I love you tonight. I'm thankful, Lord, for all that you've done. I'm thankful for your word. I bless you.